This is Will Chow, and today I am here with um, the founder of Success Insider. Um, here's a brief bio on Tim Han. Uh, he's a world-renowned coach, uh, speaker, he's an entrepreneur. He founded Success Insider. He has uh, interviewed some of the top minds from Antonio Centeno to Grant Cardone and has a reach of over 20 million people in the last 18 months on his YouTube and has over 350,000 subscribers on YouTube. So today we are going to dive into some awesome topics um, that will help you listeners and viewers really succeed at life. And we're going to talk about habit formation and we're going to talk about all these other areas of life, including how to deal with um, the obstacles and strengths you have as a uh, Asian. So starting off, first question to you, Tim, can you give a brief story about, you know, your upbringing and how you got to where you are now with Success Insider? Okay, I'll cut the long story short, otherwise we'll be here for many hours. <laughs> um, so I, I suppose I was originally born in Seoul, South Korea. Ever since I can remember, I, I was pretty much being very shy, very introverted, and I was suffering from social anxiety really bad when I was younger. And as a result, I, w I was always the outcast, uh, especially when I was growing up. I would always do things that was odd, that was always away from people. I remember one of my youngest memory was taking a notepad down to the highway and taking the notes of people's reg plates of people who were speeding. So I was acting as if I was a policeman. <laughs> now, I basically ended up moving over with a family to south of England because my mum met somebody we soon began calling dad, who was my stepdad. And we moved to a place called Poole, which is based in south of England. And everybody at the time was 99% British white there. So I, I joined middle school um, being the only oriental kid other than my sister and I, I went through a lot of bullying every single day, racial bullying and it was four years of pretty much going home every single day and acting as if I was ill and pretending I was being sick to my parents so I just can't, so just so I don't have to embrace the pain again and I suppose it got to a point where when I eventually after four years went through all that pain when I was joining high school, I told myself I can't go through that again. And I just made a bold decision to become the bully, the ones who were actually bullying me at the time. And they were at the time dealing drugs, hanging around in groups, causing a lot of pain. And it wasn't long until I became one of them. So I became the circumstances of my environment. So I went through high school for another four years as a totally different character. I became my dark shadow and I would regularly be arrested by the police. I would regularly be taking drugs every single day. And my wake up call happened on New Year's Day when I woke up because I had to be sick because I'd gone out the night before drinking a lot of alcohol. And I remember I rushed to the toilet to puke up and I had beads of sweat dripping down. And I was just being sick and sick, sick. And I had a moment of silence where it just stopped. And I remember thinking to myself, what can I do to fall asleep? I remember thinking, type presentation on YouTube. So I grabbed my laptop typed in presentation, came across some guy called Steve Jobs, which I didn't know who he was at the time. I just <laughs> saw the video, it was from Stanford commencement address speech, that it was 17 minutes long, and it looked super boring. So I just clicked on it, and little did I know, that message would resonate with something that's deep within me. Steve Jobs, at around halfway point, talked about how every single morning he would look in the mirror, and he would ask himself if today was the last day of my life, would I want to do what I'm about to do today? And that's when the answer has been no, that's when he knows he needs to change something. And that morning when I looked in the mirror, I was looking in the mirror, but nobody was looking back. I just didn't know who I became. And that's when I made a big, bold decision to leave everything I, I suppose, created in regards to friends and just be able to reinvent myself. And it was in that year I got into the world of entrepreneurship. I was watching this, uh, there's an equivalent of Shark Tank in England. My stepdad was watching something called Dragon's Den, and I was really inspired by these entrepreneurs who were so passionate about the world of business. So I started my first business at the age of 17, which was um, fulfilling a niche within our area at the time, which was under 18s had nothing to do uh, after school. So we created the under 18 clubbing events experience for every Friday to keep them out of the street. 
And I also scaled, I, I got myself onto YouTube where I would be posting my mixtapes because I was DJ back then. And that's when I got a taste of entrepreneurship. And ever since, I suppose I've not, I have not looked back because after that, I got into the world of all different types of businesses. We, you name it, eBay, Amazon. And then we did a huge launch uh, several years ago when I was involved with launching a health supplement, which did over 1.9 million in revenue in dollars. And at that time, I had a lot of people who began to hear about the success and stuff, reaching out to me, asking for advice. And that's when I thought, instead of just giving one person advice, why don't I create a YouTube channel? And through my experience of already knowing how to scale social media, I simply created Success Insider, began to share the advice, and it began to go really viral in 2016. So that's pretty much how I ended up falling into doing the Success Insider stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't going to be a business when I started. It was more, I felt it was time to give back. But ever since, I believe the door's open for a reason, so I've walked in. I hope that was short enough. That's still a skimmed down version, but. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I definitely appreciate that story. You know, a lot of people, they only see the success at the end and to hear like the bullying and all the stuff you went through, that's it's a completely different side that people need to hear. Um, my next question is on um, um, you know, struggles with, with race. I think there's a lot of young people here who are still going through stuff like that. And, you know, there's, what do you think are the pros and cons of of being you know your your ethnicity and how you know any advice for someone to you know step over those obstacles wow that's interesting how you ask in regards to the pros is most people they would all, all they all just turn around and say hey what are the negatives right i, I do i do like that question so i suppose the the cons were the fact that i i felt pain every day and physical pain as well because I was bullied by some specific individuals in my middle school who would follow me home and literally uh, get into a fight with me so I suppose the cons was it took a big toll on my personal development at the time I didn't even know what personal development was but my mindset that I was being forged that was being forged from everybody affirming I am something and I'm me believing is true such as I am fill in the blank whatever racial word I suppose the cons was I just became really insecure in regards to who I was. I just didn't believe in anything to do with myself. Um, so I was homebound pretty much every day. I suppose the pros was now looking back, there was a huge amount of pros because I wouldn't have gotten so passionate about the world of personal development at the age of 17 had I not gone through that bullying. It wouldn't have struck me to have Googled presentation and <laughs> watch random videos of guys on YouTube, right? Um, I, I think if I really connect the dots, as Steve Jobs says, looking backwards, I, I, I'm now today very thankful of the experience I've gone through. That's that's awesome. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think a lot of people can, myself included, can relate. Um, now, um, diving into... Um, habit formation and um, you know personal development I think a uh, uh, question on how we can kind of form these habits to uh, kind of get to where we want to get to in life maybe we don't all want to be speakers ourselves but we do want to live um, you know financially free um, any you know high hitting tips that aren't you know we aren't already familiar with I think a lot there's a lot of like uh, top 10 articles and I think a lot of complaint I hear from my readers is oh this is common sense anything else you have on your mind that's you know maybe like um, not so common sense that they may like take to I think I could I could share some not so common sense advice but to be honest what I've realized from educating a lot of people across the globe the most dangerous sentence that I, I see students use over and over is I already know that. Oh, I think I already heard of that. Because I, I believe knowledge, yes, is power. But then if you really think about if it was books that equaled financial success, well, librarians, they should be very financially successful. I've realized what it actually is about realizing that common knowledge isn't so much common practice. So I, I think what, what I found was very useful in my life is whenever I hear anything from mentors or anyone even in books even if it's something i already know i act as if i don't know it and i allow it to sink deeper and i would basically i would i would love to call out those you know 
those audiences who, who think that because I found that was the implication I had when I got into this world of personal development. Now, in regards to like habits, what has helped me the, the, the best, I suppose it's just really deciding what is my non-negotiable habits in my life. It's about through trial and error. I've systemized my life. And for example, right now, what I do is I've got a big annual calendar. And what I do is I, I mark my key events that I'm doing. Maybe I'm speaking or maybe there is a key event I'm doing online on these calendars. And every day I would basically either tick after that day's passed, either tick it red if it was really poor performance day in regards to the way I was productivity wise, or I would tick it green if it was high performance. And what's really interesting to see from a map point of view where the consistency lies and what normally happens when I'm inconsistent. So I, lo I love it because I'm a visual person. I love to see it from a like a like almost like a bird eye point of view in regards to my life, how I perform. So I always find systemization of performance is a very, I suppose, one of my secrets to high performance. And I've been a big fan of it. And the analogy I always like to paint is kind of like how anybody could create a burger better than McDonald's, but no, everybody could cook mil millions of burgers like McDonald's can. It's all down to how have you systemized your life? And I remember I came across this question once, which was if, for example, you, uh, you were stranded on an island and you only had a mobile phone and you can communicate with your team. If you don't have a team right now, act as if you had a team who's managing your business or managing your life and you can only communicate a team for five minutes a week what would you say during the five minute call in regards to the three key measurements of metrics that would measure how well they would perform, how well they will perform? So what that gets you clearer in regards to is what is actually worth measuring in your life. And you can take that in forms of habits, what is actually worth doing in your life. And I find morning rituals nowadays, there are so many freaking checklist of everything you should do and most people spend so much doing so much time doing a morning ritual that it almost becomes a chore in itself i think get clear in regards to what actually gives you value create the non-negotiable list do it every single morning do it every single evening and then just trim the rest kind of like that principle of 80 20 just make sure you go next level in comparison to that got it and something non-negotiable as an example would be maybe um for some it could be family time um is that correct? Would that be a I mean, for me? For me, non-negotiable in the morning is definitely some form of fitness. So gym, uh, lifting weights. Um, I find if I don't do that, my performance throughout the day, from what I can see on my annual cal calendar, it, it sucks. <laughs> got, got it. Got it. Okay, so. Um, Next question is on procrastination. I think this is one of the most uh, hot button topics with my audience. Um, they're always asking about these tips, even though there's, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, material out there already, and I'm trying to help them um, actually stop procrastinating. So, um, could you provide some uh, guidance on this topic? Yeah, I, I, I think procrastination is a very interesting one. In fact, I had to talk, my, I had to literally teach myself how to procrastinate. Because when we, that's the thing, people think that they're procrastinating, but the reality is, is if somebody had a gun to your head and said, go do it, otherwise I'm going to shoot you, you will make it happen, right? Some people say to me, Tim, oh, I can't put in the work today. And I say to them, okay, let's paint up this analogy. I will shoot you if you don't. Will you do it? And they're like, yeah. I mean, most people, they say, oh, I can't get off to the couch. I can't stop watching TV. I guarantee if your house was on freaking fire, you're going to find a way of running your ass out of there, right? <laughs> So I find people just don't have enough emotion that's leading them to the motion to actually take action. You see, when I woke up at the age of 17 and I really wanted to transform myself, I truly woke up. In fact, I had to literally teach myself to procrastinate again because I didn't, you know, yes, I used to procrastinate when I was younger, but then I didn't really label it that. I think in today's society, the problem is, is people are labeling it procrastination. So it's almost like a catch-22. They're trying to get out of it, but the more they keep on researching more about what it is, the more they find themselves procrastinating. So it's about realizing what is it that fires you up? 
yeah, this cliche stuff like find your why, yeah, it helps. But find something that's really deep and you will know when, when you find it. It's just kind of like a, a radio station. You know when you're on the right radio station, you can feel it because otherwise it's all fuzzy. You can see the, you can hear the feedback coming through. But when you tweak that dial perfectly, you're tuned in. From that tuned in, when you're tuned in, you can, you can actually tune into your heart and just really ask yourself, what do you want your life to stand for? Because every single day you've got a decision to make, either a masterpiece or mediocre. And for me, I didn't want to get to the end of my life saying, oh, I lived an okay life. I procrastinated. For me, this is like non-negotiable. I'm going to be a high performer. So I think they just got to wake up. I think people who procrastinate today, they just got to really tap into something much, much deeper. You know, you, yourself being from an Asian background, if we look at, for example, our mums or our mums mums, our mums mums, look how much they put in the work. And people today, they got it so easy, especially in the first world country. It's just like ridiculous what we complain about. It's just first world problems. Oh, whoop de doo your time management app failed today. So you procrastinated. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I say, um, I tell them that no one procrastinates playing video games. So it's, it's an interesting concept around why people use that as an excuse. Um, Moving on, I want to kind of touch on um, the second probably biggest topic that um, is constantly mentioned um, with my audience, um, and it's it's around uh, income production. So I think um, you know some of some people are entrepreneurial and they're looking for specific um, tactics, Shopify, drop shipping, and they're, they're very new to all this. But others are more employee based and they're not really looking to start that and they have no idea where to start they're looking at their passions but don't see how they can connect it to income do you have any uh you know hard-hitting tips for for these people yeah i would say firstly this was the number one thing for me get rid of your internal blockages i, I find most people in life they're in a car with one foot in the accelerator and one foot on the brake I, I speak on stages all across the globe and it, it fascinates me. It blows me back every time I'm asking this question. I always ask, hands, put your hands up nice and high if, for example, you want to be financially successful. Everybody puts their hand up, right? And then we begin to, uh, begin to talk more and then I ask this question. How many of you have ever, for example, gone onto YouTube or maybe gone onto Facebook? The first thing you see is an ad and you click skip straight away and everybody puts their hands up and they're so proud looking. And I say to them, you know, we've been talking for the last hour in regards to importers of online marketing, in regards to Facebook ads and YouTube ads. And I say to them, how do you expect to get good at something you're subconsciously avoiding? And most people in life, I find the reason why they never get great at sales, they never get great at marketing is because they're not even open to it themselves. You cannot get good at something if you're subconsciously avoiding it. When I was younger, I really hated salespeople. When I was younger, I really hated, I suppose, people with money. And that's why I was dead broke. <laughs> As I begin to grow up, I realize we cannot attract something if we're subconsciously trying to get away from it. And so whenever I come across an ad today, I'm just like, oh, great. I'm just going to check it out. If it's providing value, I'm going to buy it. If it's not, I just say no. Right? Like people walk into a store today to buy, I don't know, a t-shirt. A salesperson comes up to them and says, oh, can I help you? An automatic response that the 99% say is, no, I'm just looking. But then think about the question they're asking. They're helping you to, to get whatever it is that you want. So whenever I come across that question, I say, yeah, help me. And I can't tell you how many times a salesperson turns around and looks shocked, right? But it's about realizing, firstly, get rid of internal blockage. You cannot get great at sales. You cannot get great at marketing, which you do have to get great at if you want to make money, if you're trying to avoid it. It's like me trying to get great at playing the guitar when I hate guitarists, right? So... I've transformed my relationship in regards to mindset first. The next thing is about realizing this. I, I believe today marketing is definitely changing. And I, I saw this from not just my eyes, but I saw this from the huge companies, the way they're changing their marketing strategies. Now, for example, well, if I was to ask you, if you think of Apple, who do you think of? Steve Jobs. Right? When you think of Microsoft, who do you think of? Bill Gates. When you think of Tesla, who do you think of? Elon Musk. And when you think of Mercedes-Benz, who do you think of? 
Just nobody card. knows, right? <laughs> no, nobody knows, right? You know, it's interesting because back in the days we could hide, right? We could hide, make money, dropshipping, hide, and all of that stuff, Shopify, wherever it may be. But in this day and age, what's interesting is Tesla, all of these big brands with faces, they're coming and dominating. And it's because today it's not so much about B2C businesses, business to customer. It's not so much about B2B, business to business. It's about creating a business that's human to human, heart to heart, I like to call it. Because if you think about it, as Richard Branson says, the whole purpose of a business is to help people. And so if we really take that into account, that is our whole purpose. In fact, one of the big marketers always like to say this, do not define your business by what you do. Define it by who you serve and why you serve. When we get clear in regards to when we don't have wealth, when we don't have money, the, when we get clear, the reason for that is because we are out of service. We aren't serving. When we get clear what money is, nothing but a reflection of how much value we've added into other people's lives, then it will make sense. We've got to create a business that's designed to help people. Now, that's very basic business skills, but yet, I see so many people going into this marketplace saying, Tim, I want to make $1,000. Listen, nobody cares what, how much you want to make. People care what value you can provide to them in exchange for $1,000. And when we get out of our heads and really get into the mind of our consumers, that's when magic happens. There are so many people who come up to me today, Will, who say, Tim, I've got a genius business idea. Please listen to me. And I say to them, listen, I don't freaking care. I want to know what your consumers are saying. Are they saying it's genius? Most people spend 10 years coming up with their genius idea and never ask a single person who's their ideal target market whether or not it's good. When I began to step out of my mind and just ask, what does my market want? That's when wealth began to come into my pocket. Zig Ziglar always likes to say, you can have everything you want in your life that you want if you just help enough other people get what they want. So I could go advance into marketing, yes, but. I think the mindset behind that has been the biggest factor between my success as well as the successes of my mentors because this is what I've learned from them. Wow, very fascinating stuff. Um, a lot of great takeaways there. Uh, I definitely encourage everyone listening to kind of really reflect on that. Don't gloss over it. I think it's it's really important. Um, uh, I want to touch on speaking and, and social skills. I think that's you know uh, really cool. Um, I myself am a member of Toastmasters, and uh, you know um, most of my audience they may not care about becoming a public speaker, but they definitely care about social skills in some aspect, whether it's a relationships or romantic or or just for f making friends, which they may not have. Um, uh, can you first just touch on uh, your experience with how you have built this career as in a seemingly competitive speaking space where you're up against titans and, and how you can apply that to general um, you know, dating and, and social skills? Definitely. I think brands today, the ones who truly thrive in any niche, our biggest compet comp competitive advantage is our willingness to serve. In fact, that's I, I run a marketing event to 30 hours long. Yes, I share great tips. Yes, I share advanced marketing strategies. However, the sole thing I'm embedding into there and drilling into their brain is let's begin to serve. I call this heart fluencing. When we really influence from the heart, do the right thing because the right thing is always the right thing to do. I think that's always been my biggest advantage. Whenever I enter a new niche, so for example, the health supplement industry, when I was in that, we would always have a face. We will always show people, this is who you're communicating with. We will always, always show some level of transparency. So when I entered Success Inside, the first thing I did was to create a community because the need to belong is a deep human need. And so when you help people belong into a tribe, now how do we best do this? Think about the best belief that you can put forward. Think about, for example, what belief you want everybody to believe in in your community. Because everybody, if you look at any community, it's all built upon one belief. And at the same time, think about who the enemy could be, the common enemy. You know, every community has got a common enemy. For example, when I was in health supplement, the common enemy was a big pharmaceutical industry. 
Why? Because we're now we're all about natural health supplements, right? And the big pharma, they pretty much get paid to, to, to keep us ill. They, that's the business that they're the, the model they're running. So I, I believe the reason why I've been able to really scale it so fast is because firstly, I established the right foundation. Now from there, is about, I suppose, in regards to speaking success. Um, and I've only been a speaker not too long, about just coming up to two years now. It's all about the right connections. And I suppose most people would probably assume that, but it's about creating the, the right heart connections because we can give out our you know, business cards like there's no tomorrow. You can give hundreds of business cards out, but I'm after just that one solid connection. So I could literally go to, I hate networking parties, but say if I was going to a networking party, I will just find a way of just really just connecting with that one individual and just making that a solid relationship opposed to a lot of people who try to almost like a shotgun spread it really wide and what normally happens is when we network is we give out loads of cards and nothing ends up happening that's a waste of time so for me i just had that one lucky connection who put me in connection with uh first he had an events organization in london so he put me on his stages and then he put me in touch with uh, tour organizers, uh, event organizers out in Asia. So it's all about the connections and, of course, the skill. You, the easiest way to get onto stages is you've got to be a good salesperson. Because at the end, they organizers, if you're new to speaking, good luck trying to command a fee of 10K an hour, right? They don't know you. They, they, why would they pay that? They can't attract the audience to pay off that investment. However, if you turn around to them and say, hey, 50% of whatever I sell, you can have, which is normally the deal. And you've proven to them that you can sell or you can, you've can you convinced them you can sell. That is much, much higher likelihood you'll be able to get on these big stages out there. Yeah, that's that's really cool. Um, yeah, I love that whole idea of, of quality over quantity. Um, so, so touching on social skills and, and social skills applied, how, how can someone, um, you know, an average person apply this to their, their, their personal life um, when they're lacking in romantic and, and personal friendships? I think what's helped me the most is an analogy I came across from one of my uh, speaking tutors. He, he mentioned how our comfort zone is almost like an elastic band. And he asked me, Tim, what happens when you stretch the elastic band and you let go? And I said, it snaps back into place. He said, exactly. What happens if you stretch a little bit more and you let go? And I said, it snaps back into place. And he said, what happens though, Tim, if I just keep on stretching and never let go? And I turned around and said, well, it breaks. And he said, exactly, Tim. This is when you get a breakthrough. And the reason why, Tim, you've not had a breakthrough in speaking is because you're playing it too safe. And for me, I had a huge speaking breakthrough when I, I overcame, I suppose, one of my biggest fears, which was making my fun of myself in public. And on the stage, we did crazy stuff that night. We were dressed up in crazy gear as well. And what they essentially did was this, it stretched that elastic band so far that I just couldn't return back to normal. And ever since, straight after, in fact, next day, I spoke on stage and he said, Tim, that was the best speech you've ever given. And the reason being is when I stood on that stage the day after, I just truly didn't give a F, right? It's just like, I've just gone so far now. For me, me speaking on stage, that's nothing because I've already stretched it so far. I've like done crazy stuff on the stage. So I was just like, this is easy now. And so I think if I was to give advice to let's say somebody watching, I would say you gotta get somebody who's willing to push you to that level. Cause after all, I wouldn't have done it myself. I would have done it if somebody challenged me like that they did in that moment because that way we've got some form of accountability. So get somebody who is not gonna put up any B BS and who's who's willing to put up with your, I don't know, with your challenges and just, just really follow up with you constantly and be willing to constantly stretch that elastic band through maybe social experiments or through, I don't know, approaching girls that you find are really scary to approach. Consistency over time is what matters at the end of the day. It's not about for example, approaching a girl once and expecting to, I don't know, become confident. Consistency is the key to everything. Wealth creation, relationship, you name it. Awesome. So I do want to touch on this topic because it is one of the most uh, viewed uh, videos on your channel as well as a common theme um, amongst Asians, and, and that would be AMWF. 
Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> so, so I have to touch on it. It's one of the most talked about topics, and um, I think it's. I'm not really sure why. I guess it's just the fact that you know, um, as men, we've had a very tough time, um, you know, establishing any any type of success romantically when there's um, other forces. Um, other racial forces at play. So, um, wondering if you had any like just general tips on you know overcoming any insecurities or maybe actual obstacles there when when there's a uh, race involved. Yeah, um, you know people do. In fact, I've received a comment today. Somebody said because uh, I've taken down most of my AMWF videos because uh, originally success inside of the strategy I used to scale this YouTube channel is a strategy I call my unique niche blend strategy, which is casting the net really wide and getting the views in different niches and then going very specific. Uh, and AM AMWF was one of my big things that really took off this channel. Um, so I suppose I've left some on and today I left, a, uh, I saw a comment from some guy saying, Tim, this was a really good strategy, but it applies to all men because I wrote only for Asian men or something like that. Um, and I think the point I'm trying to get across with AMWF, I've always found is interesting. The whole niche, the whole industry, I, I should say, I, I've not really found that much difference, to be honest. I mean, I'm at the end of the day, white women, black women, <laughs> Hispanic women, they're all just women at the end of the day. And when we understand their psychology in regards to how they really work, and I've been through a lot of different dating coaches. I suppose back in the days, the PUA industry was the thing. But to be honest, times are really moving today. It's not about the canned lines. It's not about these routines or seeing them as sets or whatever, if your audience is familiar with that. I, I find what really works in this day and age is the absolute owning of your authentic truth. We can't, be, we can't help but be attracted to somebody who's really owned their own ship. We can't be attracted to... So we can't help but be attracted to somebody who really knows who they are. And the only way we can get clear of that, of who we really are, is by working on ourselves. I've always found the more I just focus on me and just let go of the outcome, the more I find the outcome coming to me. It's funny because when I was actively seeking a girlfriend, that's when I found the girls I did, I suppose, try to get with, they were just were not my type. But the moment I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to focus on me, just working on loving myself. That's when I found all of a sudden they're just all coming over to me, right? And it's interesting. And some guys will be to relate. Maybe yourself will. Have you ever found when you're in a relationship, more girls chuck you, chuck themselves over to you than before, right? <laughs> Which is crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's it's very interesting. Yeah, it's a whole dynamic yeah. behind it. Yeah, and I, I found the reason why women chuck themselves over to you when, for example, you they they see you another girl, or whatever maybe, is yes, there is the primal reason, but secondly, I believe this is the most important thing. They can see that you've worked on you. Because at the end of the day, if somebody else is dating you, there must be a reason behind that. And so my advice would be is to firstly for them to work work on the skills that you mentioned on your channel in regards to confidence, self-esteem, whatever it may be. Work on that. Get rid of all that BS conditioning because we carry so many identities within ourselves. For example, we carry the negative identity, the person we're afraid that we are. And then we, we basically carry another identity where most people live from, which is the pretend identity, the person we pretend to be in front of people. But then at the core is our actual identity. And when you get clear of who you are, you'll begin to notice a pattern, especially when you're networking. Have you ever found that you've connected with somebody that you thought you would never connect with when you're meeting with someone? Yeah, I have. I have. Um, let's see. I, I met um, uh, Jillian Zoe Siegel, who uh, she she's an interviewer herself, and she's uh, interviewed many top people like Warren Buffett. Um, and that was just like a you know a chance outreach, and she happened to to respond and want to you know do an interview with me. Yeah, and I find the reason why we connect with somebody like that is because I believe a heart speaks. I, I believe human communication is beyond words, right? And even studies show how nonverbal is a big part of that. But I believe subconsciously there is some form of 
unconscious heart-to-heart language also happening. It's, that's why we can take one look at somebody and sometimes we can get a general gist of what they are or who they are. And when we ignore, ignore the heart saying, oh, stay away from this person or I shouldn't be dating this person. And then if we just follow the head, sometimes we end up in a relationship after like eight months, we're like literally like saying, what am I even doing with my life? And we get out of it and we're like, thank goodness that's gone, right? <laughs> And so I, I believe when we get clear in regards to our core identity of who we really are, and when we begin to just unfilter that truth, and by unfiltering, I mean not holding back from saying what you really want to say, that's when people just love you for who you are. It's a raw attraction. It doesn't make you very, for example, popular with a lot of people, but it makes you popular with the right people. Awesome. I want to touch on um, what you just mentioned about that social niche strategy. I think a lot of a lot of people are looking to uh, turn their hobby, whether it's knitting or video games, into um, some level of, of uh, income and would love social media tips around that. So um, you said your strategy is kind of unique. Most people say you want to niche down or um, you know find a hook. Uh, you, you said that you should kind of go in all directions and, and then niche down. Can you elaborate? Yeah, sure. So uh, I've got one of my students also, uh, he lives uh, down the road from me actually, um, who's also taken action on this and he's getting really good results. And most people, when I share this, they don't really understand it. And even if they don't understand it, they try to take an action and then they kind of quit. So. What I found is the success rate is definitely if you take action. What what this strategy is, is about the the UMB being the eighty percent of your online marketing efforts to do of YouTube, right? This is just for YouTube strategy, by the way, in regards to scaling big on YouTube. So UMB stands for unique niche blend, and then the twenty percent of what you do on YouTube it needs to be something very specific to who you're looking to target. So for example, your regular content that goes to your specific niche. Now, the whole purpose of this is, for example, you're, if you're uploading five times a, a week, 80% of those uploads needs to be the UNB. And what the UNB is, is, a, is very much an interest you've got or maybe some stories you've gone through that tends to be in the broader market on YouTube. So, for example, I want to talk about when I created Success Insider, it was about confidence, it was about success, as the name implies. However, when I uploaded those videos, it isn't what people were searching for. And that was my 20%. I could have continued like that and gotten no views. But what I began to do is think to myself, what is my UMB? So I began to write down my passions, my interests. I was passionate about the gym, the health supplements. I was passionate about cycling. I was passionate about all these different things. So I began to post videos to do of all these different things. And then I also wrote down AMWF because I was in the AMWF relationship. And then I began to post these videos. All of a sudden, one of my UMBs took off. AMWF, all of a sudden, it goes from around, like, just to give somebody, at the time, my videos were getting about 100 views. All of a sudden, these videos were getting thousands of views. And then eventually, I had one video in the AMWF niche that got 100,000 views. And that pretty much established the whole channel because I began to get a lot of subscribers just from that effort. So I began to post more videos to do that UMB to scale the channel a little bit higher and higher and higher to get all of that uh, traffic coming through. And by then, uh, a lot of people you know, checking out my other videos because they now knew what I was all about. But what's interesting is this, your UMB actually relates back to your core content. Because what I wanted to, for example, talk about was in one of the videos was confidence. Every time I post a video such as five ways to be confident, it would get about 90 views. But the moment I would use the UMB strategy, so for example, I create a video, do white girls like Asian guys? That would get 100K views. But what do I talk about in that video? I talk about confidence. So what we're doing with UMB is almost like being in an ocean. Most people, they've got a fishing rod and they're just catching, catching one fish at a time, just getting like 10 views, 20 views. What the UMB strategy is, is casting in that net really wide and chucking into ocean and just reeling in all of the views and then actually giving them what they really need to hear opposed to what they want, right? And so I can, so for example, I, I would use it in different niches. I didn't want to create, one of my most successful videos on my channel right now is free signs you'll become rich one day. Very cliche topic. But then from my research, it was showing as a very popular topic. 
So I created that video and I was just talking about speed of action. The entire video, if you watch it, every single point is just about take action. Instead, imagine if I would have created a video, take action. That would have got like 10 views, right? So through UMB, you're able to get more views, but at the same time, be able to teach them what you actually want to teach them. So that that's my strategy on, on YouTube. I totally get it. And I, I definitely encourage anyone listening, whether you're teaching fishing or uh, knitting to, to kind of check that out. I think that's that's awesome strategy. Um, I, I want to wrap up here and um, I would say, um, you know, you, you've talked a lot, a lot of about a lot of stuff and, um, you know, viewers and listeners may not remember it all. They may forget most of it. What, what's your if you could if they could only remember one thing, what would that be? I would say the concept of heart flowing sing heart flowing sing it's something that i've recently i suppose come up with myself but it's it's something that boils down in regards to what's gotten me results in different industries what's gotten me results not in regards to just money because there's you know life is beyond money but in regards to different areas of life and what heart flowing sing is all about is realizing yeah we got to be able to influence people if we want to be successful but then influencing from the right place and there's a huge difference we can hear a speak on the stage or we can see a, somebody on video on youtube but when somebody's coming from here it's very hard to connect with that person but when somebody's just being a human being to us and just influencing from the heart coming from the right place i found we create connections all of the shields naturally just drop down because at the end of the day we are all human if you strip away all of the conditioning society has given us we are all the same we're all connected at the end of the day so i would tell them the one thing to take away is to surf from the heart and influence from the heart is all about h2h thanks so much for your time um is there any uh website or company or service you want to plug uh, I suppose if they want to check out uh, more of my work, the best gateway drug, let's say, <laughs> probably would be to go over to the YouTube channel, uh, our success inside the YouTube channel. So simply type that in on YouTube. If it fits, great. Awesome. Welcome aboard. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Tim. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Bye. Thank you.